Good morning, everybody. This morning, we are so excited to share um, some lessons for, from Fiji. That is um, this morning's sermon title. And um, to add a little more to Genesis' story, actually, we will do that little, a little later in the story, um, in the sermon, but she did. She did almost uh, kill me. Where is she? <laughs> but I'm still here, Genesee. Um, I'm so, so proud to see uh, those of us who went on the trip and made it to church this morning. We got back on Wednesday, and we are exhausted uh, many of them have bruises all over their body. Um, you will so soon learn why. Um, a few of them are not here this morning. They're not feeling well. Um, but thank you so much for showing up this morning to talk about and share about our trip. And I want to thank this community. Without your prayers and your donations, this trip would not have been possible. Um, without the, men the years of mentorship, this trip would not have been possible. Um, and so just a big, a big thank you. And uh, let's bow our heads for prayer before we get um, into our message. Dear Heavenly Father, as we gather here today, we thank you for the opportunity to reflect on the lessons from our mission trip to Fiji. We invite your presence into this place and into our hearts. May your Holy Spirit guide us as we explore the stories, experiences, and wisdom uh, shared today. Help us to open our hearts to your leading, to be flexible in your plan, and to be inspired by the, by the spontaneous movements of your spirit. Bless this time of sharing and learning. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. This morning I will be sharing ten lessons our group learned in Fiji. And really, it, it, it could have been a hundred less, lessons because we learned um, a lot uh, we will start with lesson number one. Each lesson will also uh, include a few passages. And uh, one of my biggest pitches for mission trips is these themes that we learn in Scripture come to life when we're abroad. They also come to life when we're local. And so I believe these ten lessons are ones we can apply to our daily spiritual lives, to our missional lives, um, regardless of whether you get the opportunity to travel on a mission or not. The first lesson is go, just do it. When I got here in 2020, I got a, a little job description. And a few things stood out from that job description. I was told this church is passionate about a number of things, but evangelism is one of them. The second one um, is local outreach and mission trips. The youth love mission trips. I started in 2020 when that was not possible. Um, and so for years, the kids had been begging. Um, they went to Kenya, and Kenya was a really uh, transformational trip uh, for them. And so they had been begging to go abroad, that it seemed like everything was closed. And Venice Risk Management was advising us not to travel out of the country. And so for the last three years, I emailed uh, the foundation's uh, founder. I emailed Marcha Tuma. And Dr. Dennis, who you will soon learn more about, who's the local uh, coordinator in Fiji, and Janet, the American travel coordinator. And I just said, please keep us updated. Uh, when Fiji opens up, we would love to go. In 2017, I got the chance to take the last church I was pastoring uh, to Fiji. And that was such a special trip. I fell in love with the community and with their work, uh, the mission at Atubu uh, Creek's work, and so I um, thought that that would be a great place for us to go. In February of this year, we finally hear back from Dr. Dennis, and he said, there are a number of, of hoops you're going to have to jump through, but the borders are open. You're going to have to get insurance, and that insurance has to cover uh, COVID-19. You'll have to get uh, COVID-19 testing uh, before you fly and when you land. But if you want to come, the borders are open. And so we shared this with our board. We shared this with our youth, um, and the kids were excited. 
Uh, about a month and a half later, they dropped all of those extra hoops, which made it a lot easier uh, for this group to go. We ended up taking 28 people to Fiji. Um, but we only had from February till uh, August to do this. To just give you a picture of this, this daunting idea, uh, our cost, just our travel cost was $76,000. Uh, for our group, and we had just months, it seemed like just weeks, to raise this money. Um, if you saw in the video, we also gathered supplies. I think uh, a number of you here um, who uh, donated medical supplies for the clinic, uh, we gathered school supplies, clothes, um, and our group of 28 took off um, in, in August. Just do it. I remember when I got that message from Dr. Dennis saying, our borders are open, you can come. And I thought about all of the things we already had on our calendar for this year um, and some of the transitions that our church was then going through. And I really wanted to pretend not to see that message because I was scared that we weren't going to be able to raise enough funds to do it. Um, I, had, I was definitely lacking in faith for sure. Um, and looking at everything it would take for us to go, um, I was, even just thinking about it, exhausted. Um, a, a, a verse comes to mind now as I look back at what we all accomplished, and that is I, the, what we read in Isaiah. Do not fear, for I am with you. Do not be dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you and help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. I invite you um, in those moments when you want to say no, when you hear the spirits calling and you look at the road ahead and you're like, this is just too daunting, too complicated, um, I would invite you to lean in and to trust and to just do it. I want to explain this picture. So uh, on the second night that we were there, there's this hike uh, that they, the locals like to call the Cannibal Cave. I think we have a picture of the of the Cannibal Cave in the next slide. So we'll go back. We'll go back to the point picture. Um, and it's it's a crazy hike. It was very wet um, the day in the days before. And so uh, I don't know who this is, but one someone from this group. It's Jaden. Jaden, okay, Jaden has no shoes on, but Jaden is rock climbing up this wall. This hike, which is not very long, it's just very steep, uh, traumatized this group. And we went on a few more hikes and they were like, we don't want to go if it's like the Cannibal Caves, but they had a ton of fun. Um, and I, I think this was a highlight because we heard about it um, almost every day. Um, but just do it. The second lesson is hospitality matters. I won't talk too much about this because at the end we're going to invite some people from our group to come and share. And what you will hear in most of their stories is about the beautiful hospitality. Uh, from, the peop from, the, from the Gateway Hotel staff, which is the, we, went, we had a longish layover um, right next to the International Airport. And, uh, it was recommended to us that we go and we have breakfast and we shower. The ways that the, the staff took care of us to the uh, Natuvu Creek housekeepers, the, I would call them the cooking mamas or the mamas in the kitchen, um, Siwa, who was our leader, our local leader while we were there, um, and he's the campus chaplain, um, to the ways that he walked with us and stayed with us and helped us to Dr. Dennis um, we were met with such beautiful hospitality. Hospitality matters. And um, at this time, I want to invite uh, Karina to share a little more um, under this point. And I'm going to give her the white mic. Happy Sabbath. I think just watching that video just kind of makes me remember and cry because everyone there was so nice. Uh, I remember from the moment that we started on, on the bus through the jungle <laughs> to our destination, it was a three-hour drive. 
every village that you pass through, everybody, I mean everybody, the kids, the grandparents, the, the parents, everyone that would see you drive by just said hi to you. They had a wave or they would run after the bus and wave. It was just, it was beautiful. And I think the other thing that I wanted to share was so we met a, a wonderful family, and I think Genesee spoke a little bit about the kids, but this is Dennis and his wife, and they are from Argentina and Chile, I believe. And they pretty much left, they grew up with uh, missionary parents. Uh, I believe Dennis's parents were in Madagascar, and I can't remember where his wife's parents were, but they were both, they both grew up as missionaries. And as they started, you know, getting older and seeking their, their career paths, they, um, they, I guess they met, and then they ended up um, studying to be nurses. And Dennis's father was working in Fiji, and he was head of the um, mission there. So long story short, they, they both decided to, to put it in God's hands, and if God wanted them to be there, he was going to make it happen. Before Dennis decided to go to the mission, he said he wanted to be a dentist, and he was uh, really short of finishing that. Um, his schooling. So when they told him, yes, go ahead and finish your school and then come on over, then he knew that was God's plan for him and his family. And they have two wonderful children who have adapted to Fijian life. I remember being on a, on a truck and, and the little boy screaming at a car passing by uh, in Fiji, and it was just so sweet to see them embrace the culture as well as you know i think the village was about 10 15 minute walk from the mission but they also um would come with us to the village without parental guidance or parental um supervision but i think everyone there was their parents because they were just enjoying life um getting wet going in the water um playing with the kids, playing soccer and volleyball. It was just, it was so nice to see um, the way they, they interacted with, with the kids there and the way they interacted with us. I feel that for me, their family life and their family structure and how they, they, they show the love for each other and for others is just, uh, it's changing. It changes my, my heart and my perspective on what uh, God wants from us. So I don't know if I share too much, but thank you so much for listening to me. It's kind of amazing because, like Karina said, the kids are like just free to roam the island. And one uh, day we were asking Donna, we we're like, do you want to go back to Argentina? And she's like, no, I have so many amigos here. And the local Fijians talk to the kids in Fijian. Um, they are in a uh, English Fijian school. And so it's so wonderful to see um, that Dr. Dennis and his family uh, play such a beautiful role in the ways that they embrace all of the groups that come, uh, groups from America, from Europe, from Australia, New Zealand, um, and, and they, alongside with the Fijians, just showed us tremendous love. Uh, when we got back, um, I was thinking about all of the, the home-cooked meals that we had in Fiji, and um, what a luxury it is to have steady home-cooked meals. Um, and all of my meals since have not been that great. Um, but it was just so beautiful. Hospitality matters. Um, Hebrews 13, uh, 2 says, Do not neglect to show hospitality to strangers, for thereby some have entertained angels unaware. 
Um, the third lesson we learned is wholehearted passion for Jesus will naturally ignite and inspire a fervent love for him. The first thing um, that I think just like cracked open all of our hearts um, were, uh, was seeing how proudly and loudly the Fijian people um, sing their songs. And we got to visit one public school. And in the public school, it has some a few Adventist students. And we had given out like VBS uh, leftover stuff. One of, uh, one of the ladies on the trip uh, donated a ton of her church's leftover VBS um, material. And so a couple of days before we visited that, that school, that public school, we had gone into the village and we handed out like VBS pins that said like, Jesus loves you or um, things like that. And we went to the public school and these kids were proudly wearing their badges. It was so cute. And uh, the public school was so kind to let us in. And we were singing songs with the kids. Um, and they were asking us to sing that Making Melodies song that Genesee uh, sang and the Peace Like a River. At the end of singing their songs, they were like, can we do those songs too? And we did them. Um, and I have a few short video clips um, that I'd like to show at this, at this time. The thing that was amazing about this, especially our time with the kids, and that video clip with the little group of kids singing, uh, they just started singing. We didn't even ask them to. There was another time where uh, Michelle and I were like, can you do this song again? And they would just on the spot start singing. Uh, we did an AY program, a Saturday evening, like sundown program. And without notice, the Pathfinder Club was called up by one of the elders, and they were asked to sing a song in Fiji. And, and they just come up, they like gather, they choose their song, and they sing so loudly and so proudly. And it was so inspiring to watch. Um, and then it was, it, we had a number of opportunities for our youth to go up there and uh, do worship. We had George uh, do worship, at least, I think, two times. He did worship for the Fijian staff of Nutuvu, and then he went in front of all the kids um, during chapel and shared um, a message to them. And it was so exciting to see uh, how our youth responded to the Fijians' passion uh, and love for Jesus um, with equal passion and love for Jesus. And um, again, I want to repeat that point, wholehearted passion for Jesus will naturally ignite and, and inspire a fervent love for him. Um, and the, the verses um, that I'd like to share at this time are Matthew 5, 16. In the same way, let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. And Romans 1, 16, for I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. For I am not ashamed of the gospel. When I saw these beautiful kids sing so loudly, um, and as I thought of this passage, I thought of all the times that I've been ashamed to shine my light or to talk about Jesus. And here are these beautiful kids, uh, both in church school and in public school, unafraid to tell their peers of their love um, and their relationship with Jesus. And it was so, so inspiring. 
So often, we, mission groups will go abroad thinking that we are primarily going to teach the local people about our God. And I think on this trip, it was a little bit of both. Um, but we were often, every single day, inspired by their love and their worship um, for, uh, for God our Father. The fourth lesson is those who have little often give the most. Those who have little often give the most. As we were visiting these villages, um, it was so tempting uh, to feel maybe a little bit of pity. Uh, Jennifer Porter, uh, Sharon Custer's daughter, got invited to visit one of the school teachers' house. And she told us about this at our next meal. But she visited this, this teacher's house. Um, and the teacher was so excited to have Jen come in. She was like, Jen, you know, come in, like, you know, uh, meet my house or whatever. Um, and Jen was telling us this, this, this house was really just like concrete with a blanket on top of it um, and a hot plate. And that was all. That was the entire house, like the size of a closet. Um, and yet these, pe these people, the Fijian uh, community there, was so gracious and so willing to give of their time, to give of um, their love for Jesus, to give even of their resources. Uh, we visited a church called the Butha SDA Church. And uh, something that we noticed at the very end, the Fijians um, sang like the closing sundown song. And we were trying to like pass out their hymnals. And we noticed that none of their hymnals had a front cover and a back. Like they were just like, it was just the middle pages. And their Bibles were just like in really, really bad shape. And so after that, um, we approached one of the elders and we said, we would love to replace all of your hymnals and all of your Bibles. How many do you need? And Siwa uh, was like, hmm, we, we, if you get us 10, 10 of each, we'll share 10. And we said, no, Siwa, we don't want to get you 10. Tell us how many you need. And he was like, okay, I'm going to get back to you at lunch tomorrow. And he comes back to us at lunch and he says, look, I know that you guys really want to replace our Bibles and our hymnals, but we have another need that, is, uh, that needs to take priority. And he said, what we really need is we need funds so we can send our Pathfinder uh, team, our young people, off on a campery that they've been raising funds for, but they just haven't, they don't have what they need. It was so beautiful to see their gen generosity, those who often have little uh, give the most. And of course, this makes me think of the story of the poor widow who uh, put her two small copper coins um, in the offering. Uh, Matthew 12, 43 says this, and he, Jesus, called his disciples to him and said to them, truly I say to you, this poor widow uh, has put more in all of those than all of those who are contributing to the offering box, for they all contributed out of their abundance, but she out of her poverty. She has put in everything she had, all she had to live on. Those who have uh, so little often give the most. And less, lesson five is lest we forget. On the last day of uh, our trip, every night we would have worship with uh, our group, and the last question was, what don't you want to forget? And we all 28 of us went around the circle and shared what we, uh, what we hope not to forget. And at the end, I challenged the group, don't forget this community. The power of mission isn't just like jumping to country and country. Uh, country to country to country, doing work, but it's investing, it's remembering a community. And this uh, made me think of um, the nonprofit that was founded uh, because of this church in, in a mission trip that this church took to Kenya years ago. There was a number of families who went on that trip, and when they got back home, uh, the people of Kenya were heavy on their hearts, and they founded uh, the In God's Hands uh, nonprofit. And a number of you guys are involved with In God's Hands. Um, some of those same, uh, some of the board members for In God's Hands, and uh, two of the founders were on our mission trip to Fiji. 
And um, when they, it was in Fiji during one lunch break, some of the board members went off to another table um, and they voted to adopt some of the local Fijian projects because yes, it was important that they went on the mission trip, but they really want to continue to remember and invest in this community. And uh, when they got back, they created a little magazine and one of the projects that they are going to sponsor is uh, Feeding the Borders. We were told we visited uh, the local school, the closest school to Natuvu, and um, we were told that the borders really have very little to eat. Um, and so now In God's Hands has a sponsorship opportunity to feed the borders. And I believe there are a number of these pamphlets out in the visitor's table if you want more information. But remember... Uh, to our group who went, remember, whichever way you choose to do so, if you choose to go through In God's Hands uh, and uh, collaborate with them, or you continue to partner up with our church in the ways that we are going to continue um, serving the, the people in Nachibu Creek, uh, do not forget the experiences that we, uh, the people and the experiences that we had. Proverbs 19.17 says, Whoever is generous to the poor lends to the Lord, and he will repay him for his deed. And Matthew 25.35 uh, and 36 says, For I was hungry, and you gave me food. I was thirsty, and you gave me drink. I was a stranger, and you welcomed me. I was naked, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you visited me. I was in prison, and you came to me. I often tell our youth that when we... Um, when we think about our social responsibility, the social responsibility that we see in scripture, to imagine a tree. A tree has so many branches, and God isn't asking us to care for the entire tree. Instead, God is asking us, pick an area. So some of you, your area might be mission work, like it was for our group. For some, other, uh, for some other people, your area might be looking after the homeless, uh, like you do once a month. It might be uh, spending some time and like uh, helping out with Meals on Wheels or the local school. Um, one of the things uh, that really uh, kind of caught me off guard this time around was uh, how every area that we went to just had like extreme and immense need. And I remember going back to my room one of the nights and like telling my husband, Philip, like it's so overwhelming because there's so much need here. Every, every community, every village, every home we visited had like seven like really important things that they needed. Like how do we help them all? And I was telling my husband, it's almost like some of today or the day that I talked to him was so overwhelming that really it's almost easier just to like look away and just not see the need that is um, in front of us. Um, and so many of us, I know I've done that so much because it's so overwhelming, but do not forget uh, those that God has asked us to keep close. The widow, the foreigner, the poor, the ill. Uh, lesson number six, continue to invest continue to uh, invest in. We're going we're gonna, to uh, just move on from this one because I talked a little bit about it in, in point five. Uh, point seven, whatever you do, do it with all of your heart. So this morning, um, I'm going to ask those who have clothes uh, from Fiji that we ordered from Juanita's tailoring shop to please stand. So Heidi, Karina... Uh, George, Peter, Caleb, uh, where's, oh, Genesee. So you will see this dress. Uh, there's a lady on, on site who has a little tailoring shop. It's like the size of a closet. You can sit down now. Um, the size of a closet. And she has been doing this job. She, uh, how she makes her living is groups will visit the, the mission. And then if you would like to purchase something from her, you like make a little appointment, you go and you see her. She takes your measurements and she has like a ton of different fabrics and you will put an order. And she was telling, um, she was telling us that she's been doing this for like 30 years and her husband is disabled, has been disabled since birth, and um, 
even, even then she was like, but he was a captain. In his young days, he was a captain uh, in, here in Fiji. But now he can't work. So now it's my turn to step up and provide for my family and also my extended family. And she does this through making the beautiful garments that we have on today. Um, she was so happy because our group put in a pretty large order, which was going to make it possible for her to provide for her family. About half the year, the mission has no visitors, so they really need to like rally together and really work hard to make enough money in the first half of the year to um, be able to afford uh, the cost of living for the second half of the year. And the second to last day that we were there, we found out we were... Uh, she had taken all our orders, and we were just going back into our shop to pick up what we had purchased from her and to pay her. Um, and we found out that Juanita, the tailor's um, sister-in-law, had died. Somebody from our group had gone in there, and they had kind of seen her a little, like, flustered and frustrated. Um, and they asked her, like, you know, is there anything that's going on? And Juanita told them, my sister-in-law died, and my whole family's on the other side of the island. Um, and I'm just, you know, I'm just getting, uh, I'm finishing up these last orders, and I'm going to go and be with them. And uh, a number of us went in there, and we ended up just canceling the order. Um, we, still, we still paid her for her time and her services, and that allowed her to, to leave the mission faster and go and be with her family. Um, and while she was waiting for her bus, I sat next to her and I started asking her, I was like probably being a little too invasive, but I was asking her about her life and her story, and through tears, she made a little joke. Um, and uh, we, we got that, uh, we have a little video of... This is okay. like work, like work. But you told me. <laughs> what do you want them to do? Mm, I said, if I happen to die, and then maybe Dr. Dennis will email all over the world, and you will see that one is going to be buried on a certain date, then everybody who, wear, who buy the clothes from Wana's tailoring shop here in Natubu, you will wear your clothes on that day because that is a memory of her, her funeral. So, so, so that is my message to you all and I hope that you will bear that in mind. If you happen to see Wana's funeral, all wear your clothes because that will be a special day for me. Oh, yes. <laughs> if you found it a little hard to understand, so what she said is, um, when I die and you hear about this on, like, Facebook, on Instagram, on WhatsApp, uh, please wear the clothes that I made you. Seeing Juana's passion for her work um, as a tailor, uh, seeing her little office, she had, like, a number of sewing machines, and it's so hard to service them and to fix them that when they break, she has to put them aside and wait for someone else to donate them. She works in a tiny little closet, and yet she is so happy and proud of the skill that she has, and she uses this skill to provide for her and her family, and then this... Uh, death kind of happened out of nowhere, um, and she was crying, and she was so thankful that she was going to be able to help uh, bury her sister-in-law. Uh, and this just reminded, we were talking about her story that night uh, during worship, and uh, the verse that came to mind is, whatever you do, do it with all of your heart, as for working for the Lord, not for human masters. In Juanita's work, um, with the clothes that she makes, it is just so obvious that she does this as a ministry and she does this uh, working for the Lord. Lesson eight, leave room for spontaneity. Uh, in John, we get this really curious description of the Holy Spirit. Uh, we read in John 3, 8, the wind blows where it wishes and you hear its sound, but you do not know where it comes from or where it goes. So it is with everyone who was born of the Spirit. Leave room for spontaneity um, and leave room for the Holy Spirit. And um, at this moment, I'm going to invite Heidi Manrique up to share some thoughts. Um, so I know a lot of you guys have been on mission trips and I have been on a few, but Honestly, the pervasive thing that I always bring back is, and, and it happened again, was 
the the fact that in our culture, you know, we really pride ourselves in being very organized and punctual and having a clear view of all the things that we've studied for in our education that we have really determined are good things, right? And and yet it seems that we come back and we enter this situation where we're just sort of going, 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 you know, and it just becomes a routine. And thank God for the Sabbath, right? But when you go on a mission trip, this is where where finally it seems that the team comes together on God's plan, on God's mission. And everybody submits because, right, you're not going to be the crazy person running your own <laughs> mission. Everybody's trying to do their own thing. And it's beautiful because that's how, you know, the spirit moves in this in this moment of submission where everybody commits to the leadership, where everybody commits to the plan, but yet the leadership finds this way to move this whole group and it just is perfect. And you don't even know how it turned out to be perfect or what happened, but the divine appointments are made. Things that weren't, couldn't have been planned happen the way they should have. And, and I think it just always reminds me that, you know, like I always think that maybe I can do it better or something, you know, better than God or I don't know. We just think that we have such good ideas. And, you know, God has pre-designed so many things that we can't do ourselves or, or even imagine. And every time I go on a mission trip, you know, he's able to really show that to me and I can see God's hands move. And sometimes it's hard to see God's hand move here because there's no room, you know? We really got it nailed down and to the par. When you go away and you let the spirit move, I mean, you can see it and it makes, it, it kind of fills you with confidence because then you know God is there. And I just really love it when that happens. You know, how many people don't want to see God just do miracles all the time, right? It's beautiful, but there, if there's no room, then there's no room. So that, I mean, it's just amazing that it happens every time. I don't know if it's just a function of our culture or what it is, but, it, you know, it's, it doesn't happen as often here. And I pray that, you know, when I'm here this time again, that I'm able to really leave that room and just empty empty my plans, empty my really weird ideas because they're bizarre sometimes and I need to accept it. <laughs> And, I, and it really was a miracle. For some of the things that we were doing, we were just given like an afternoon's notice or a moment's notice. And so to um, be expectant in that way, to expect God to show up and then see God show up is just such a beautiful thing. Um, and it, it was just really beautiful. So thank you. Leave room for spontaneity. Um, lesson number nine, do not do it alone. Two is better than one. Something that we would see when we would go through the villages, one m m village mother would care for all of the village children. Um, and someone from our group shared with us that the reason why is that they take turns. So one mom, let's say on a Monday, will care for all the kids so the rest of the moms can go um, and help and work or, or maybe take a rest. And then on Tuesday, a different mom. And it was really beautiful. I mean, we... Uh, in raising kids, you know, often, it's often said it takes a village, and to see that in action was so beautiful. Melanie, uh, who was one of the participants in our group, um, at one of the nights when she was sharing what she didn't want to forget, she talked about the evening worship. Melanie is a new, uh, newish member to our church, and she came on this trip to serve, but also to get to know some of um, this community. And Melody, uh, through tears in her eyes on the last night, was telling us um, that something she didn't want to forget were those evening worships, because she had recently lost both of her parents, and those evening worship uh, gave her a sense of family and of home. Don't do it alone. This walk, uh, this spiritual journey isn't meant to be done or to be walked alone. Do it together. 
And we know, we know these verses, Hebrews 10, 24, and 25 says, and let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works, not neglecting to meet together, as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day drawing near. In Matthew 18, 20, for where two or three are gathered in my name, there I am among them. And the last point um, is listen, obey, go, and love. Uh, Matthew 25, um, oh, I lost my place for a second. Listen, obey, go, and love. Um, on one of the evenings, George went up and he shared this beautiful story. Um, he talked about the meaning behind a, uh, one of the hymns that we're going to sing at the very end. Um, and I'm going to invite him at this time to come up and to share a little snippet of the history of that hymn and then his experience getting to share in Fiji a couple of times. All right, well, this story I got or that she wants me to speak about is actually one I got from one of the elders at this church, and you'll see how that plays into the whole point of the story at the end. Um, but who here knows the song, I've Decided to Follow Jesus? All right, now who here knows how that song was written? I mean, they do now, but... A lot of you guys, I'm guessing, don't. Well, 150 years ago, in the Britain area, in the great land of Wales, with the rolling green hills, there was a great revival. Now, great revivals, in case you don't know what they mean, is a resurgence of Christianity or well, any other religion in that certain area. Now, amongst these people were, was a man and his family, William Jensen Reynolds. Now, he obviously, was converted to Christianity during this great revival, and he felt a drawing to go and explore the world and become a missionary. Um, now, he, his two kids, and his wife decided the greatest place to start would be the Middle East. So they came to the Middle East, converted people, met some opposition, and um, kept them going until they reached India. Now, in case you don't know, India, majority of the country is Hindu. And some people anywhere in the world, would not be exactly accepting to a man converting their entire village into a completely different religion. Now, William Jensen Reynolds had entered one of these villages, no one knows the name of it, and proceeded to convert the first three people he saw. Now, that is a fantastic thing, but the village chief obviously was not very happy about it, so he said, if you don't stop converting my people by tomorrow, I'm going to kill you and your entire family. That's obviously not the nicest thing in the world to say. So they want to sleep on it, and they, the chief hoped, well, maybe, just maybe I won't have to kill them. Maybe they'll just relax and leave. And the next day when the chief woke up, he saw them, and turns out they had converted five more people. So he, it's not a comical story, I'm just saying. Um, it turns out that, well, I'm sorry. So he, turns, so he converts the five people, and... Then the chief comes out, he's mad. He's like, man, I don't like this. So he lines them up and he says, I give you one more chance to rescind your faith or else I'll kill your children. The man said, I have decided to follow Jesus. There's no turning back. And the chief ordered his archers to shoot his children. And as one of his children lay on the floor, the last words was, just listen to the man, listen to what he has to say. And he said sorry to his kid, and the chief says, I give you another chance to listen to me and rescind your faith, and your wife can live, and if you don't, your wife shall join your children in death. And the man said the famous words, the cross before me, the world behind me, there is no turning back. And they shot down his wife next. Leaving now our main man, William Jensen Button, or William Jensen Reynolds, um, they asked him one more time, are you really going to die with your entire family because you have a faith to a man 
2,000 years ago in a land no one knows, and, or at least they didn't know. And he said, again, the cross before me, the world behind me, I've decided to follow Jesus. And then William Gentle Reynolds and his entire family was killed in that village. But his legacy didn't die in a way. That day, a miracle happened in the village. Like I said, the chief had questioned his faith and said, who would want to follow a man who died 2,000 years ago in a land that, at least in India, they haven't heard about? And he said, if these guys are that faithful, maybe, just maybe, I want a taste of that faith. So that second, moments after he killed a family of four for their beliefs, he said, I too have decided to follow Jesus. And that, that day he converted his entire village into Christianity. At the start of the day, he had killed a family of four over their beliefs. And at the end of the day, he had believed in the same religion that they had killed him before. Sorry, bad wording there. Anyways, I don't want to leave the stage today without at least having one story. I know this wasn't part of the plan, but the true unsung hero of this trip was definitely Albert, Mr. Pardo. He was the one who inspired me to go up and give those two worships to the people in the church and the staff. Albert gave us a very moving story about his deployment and how Jesus kept him safe. So anyways, yeah, so that's my story. Think about it. And um, it's a very powerful story, I think. And anyways... And we have a picture of George uh, sharing this story in front of the school. Um, it should be a few slides down. But again, it was so beautiful. And, and um, so here he was sharing it to the staff um, who were a little outside of the picture. And there was another photo of him sharing it at the school. Anyway, it was so wonderful to see uh, all of our youth participated in some way, even those who public speaking um, is not their gift, still did some form of public speaking. And I think of Kathy Riggs. Um, one night she was asked to give a, a uh, night worship, and she got up there and she was so, um, what she shared was so profound and was so just naturally, uh, she commanded like the group so naturally. And it was so beautiful to see uh, how God used so many people uh, in our group um, in some way. Um, and so again, that last point is listen, obey, go, and love. The words um, of Ellen White uh, were with me all of that week. The strongest argument in favor of the gospel is a loving and a lovable Christian. The strongest argument in favor of the gospel is a loving and lovable Christian. Um, and we experience that through the love of the local Fijian people, through uh, Dr. Dennis and his family, through the love that we experienced amongst each other. Um, and to our group, the last thing I will say is it will be tempting to always to like wrap this up and, and think of Fiji as the paradise that it is uh, and to wish that our life here looked more like that, was maybe a little bit more slower, um, easier in ways. Um, and so my challenge for you is coming back and taking all that you have learned um, and using that in our local community. That is the beauty of mission. You don't have to go across the world to do mission uh, and to live missional uh, focused lives. We can do that every day in our backyards, in our families, um, in our relationships. And so the last thing um, I would like to do, if anyone from our group would like to come up and share anything, it doesn't have to be a long story, maybe uh, something you learned or something that was meaningful, um, you have the opportunity to do so now. And um, after that, we're going to come up and we're going to sing, I have decided to follow Jesus. Hello. All right. Happy Sabbath. I'm surprised none of our none of our group members said this, but it's like hello in Fijian. It says bula. Can we all say it? Bula. 
Bula, the other day I was at the grocery store and I almost, it almost slipped out <laughs> when I went to go see the cashier. I'm like, hey, Bula, and I caught myself. I'm like, what am I doing? But yeah, I really miss Fiji. Um, one of the things I'm not going to miss are the mosquito bites. <laughs> Our, our feet's covered in mosquito bites, scratches and bru bruises and all that. And I, wanna, I just want to ask a question. Or whoever here has been on a mission trip, can, we, can you please stand? Whoever's been on any type of mission trip, wow, can you please stand? Can we all give a hand? <laughs> stand up, stand up, stand up, stand up. That's a lot of you guys. Look around, look around. Please keep standing because I want to ask you guys all a quick question. So if I look around, that's like a good 30 people. All right, starting from here, I just want to see which country you visited last, and then we'll just go through the row. Out loud. Fiji. Fiji. And then once you say your thing, you can sit down. So Fiji. Brazil. Awesome. Mexico. Mexico. New Mexico, Mexico. Thank you. In the back. Indiana. Indiana. Wait, where? Oh, India. Awesome. Africa. Costa Rica. Awesome. All right, thanks, Gary. And then next to Gary. Oh, both of you guys been to Fiji. Awesome. Indonesia. Puerto Rico. Oh, it's like the Puerto Rican row. <laughs> awesome. Fiji. And there's one more over there. I saw you sit down too quick. Tanzania. Awesome. Bolivia. Bolivia. Philippines. India. Samaba. Let's go. All right, we got a few more, like six more over here. The one in the back with the pretty flower dress. Yeah, sure. Yeah. Greece. Belize. Oh, Belize. Fiji. DR. Fiji. Arizona. Arizona, nice. Holbrook in Arizona? Yes. Holbrook's really awesome. Wow. That's a big group. Um, as a media guy and uh, mission work, we took a lot of photos and videos, and all the kids were asking, like, where are all these photos? Where are these, like, how's your church? And all that. And we told them we're based out of California and that we have a good, strong group. As you can look, there was, like, at least 40-plus missionaries that went on a mission and experienced something that was hardship or spread the love of Jesus. And that's awesome. That's really awesome. And if we, I don't know if we can do this really quick, but the kids want to see how or who we are for Louis Miguel. So if everybody could get up, get on stage really quick to, get, to take a group, uh, group photo, and we'll send it to the Fijian locals. And yeah, if you can do that really quick. <laughs> All right, so everybody on the stage, take a group photo. On the stage, on the stage, on the stage. And we'll take it in 10 seconds. So if everybody could go on the stage for a group photo, please don't miss out. Er Everybody, everybody, please. The whole church, the whole church. On the stage, on the stage. It's like a group, lovely family photo. Yes, the whole church, the whole church. This is awesome. So we get the whole church, um, and we'll take it for your photo. Even if you're a visitor or you're visiting or guest, please get on the stage so we can take a group, lovely photo. After this, we'll continue sharing the testimonies and yeah. I still see a lot of people <laughs> in the pews, so if you can make your way up, that'll be awesome. We still got a lot of room in the front, so if, whoever wants to sit in the front, please do so. This is awesome. Well, if you look around, this is how heaven's going to look like. <laughs> a 
last chance, whoever is on the pews, please feel free to get on the on the stage. We'll be taking it in five seconds. On Bula, we say, oh, on three, we say Bula. One, two, three. Bula. Awesome, guys. You guys can take a seat. Thank you. But yeah, while visiting Fiji, it felt like, we're still continuing sharing. It felt like, um, it felt like heaven with the locals and all that. So we're going to send them that photo to show who we are missionaries whether we go out of the country or whether we do it at home um, but yeah we'll pass it on to Peter I was with everybody I just want to say that I think one thing that stood out to me in Fiji was I remember the Sabbath right before we left for Fiji I don't know her name but I think she's the leader of the greeting ministry she came up here and talked about how important greeting was in to coming into the church and when I was there, everybody was just so welcoming, like Tanya said. And over there, they're just so generous. And it's just, here in America, like, we invite people over dinner and out to lunch. And but sometimes it feels forced. It feels like, oh, it's mandatory in order to make a friend. But there, it just feels so generous, genuine. They don't even need a greetings ministry there because everybody just shakes your hand, welcomes you, says hi, is friends with you immediately. And I just thought that was so beautiful. Hi, uh, mine is just a small story. Um, me, Moises, Caleb, and my two parents, we actually, we came to Fiji a little, a one week earlier just to like, I guess enjoy before we started the mission. And uh, one of the days we went on a, like, just like a surf trip, you know. Uh, I'm, I surf, but I'm not very special at surfing. So we went to a surf trip. I didn't expect anything too much, but we decided to check out Cloud Break. And uh, anybody who knows surfing knows Cloud Break as a world famous, beautiful surf spot. And we, we looked at it, we thought it was great. And uh, we were all just like, we, we really had decided that we weren't really gonna surf there until our, our, like our boat driver, he said, are you guys nervous? And right there, we, we just we had to go. We had to like prove him wrong. So we went on cloud break. It was okay. I stayed far away because I was I had never gone on a shortboard surfboard in my life. I had only gone on like little like smaller boards, but none of them were glass. So I was there. I was really nervous because it was probably like a like a four to six day, eight to, eight to ten day. Um, and it was it was crazy. And so I stayed away, trying to stay away from the sets. And uh, the biggest set of the day comes in, but from the wrong direction, directly to where me and Moises were staying. So we, we see it and we just start paddling because we're just trying to get over that set. And so we're just going, we're going. Moises has more stamina than me, so he was like starting to pull ahead and I was like falling behind. And uh, we barely make it over that first wave, right? As it's like, cr like cresting and it's about to drop, we barely make it over. And I have like a huge sigh of relief, I made it. And I get over there, I get over, and I just see a bigger wave coming. It was just like, biggest wave I've seen that entire day, and I, you, you could tell right away, you were not gonna make it. So Moises, he was probably 20 yards in front of me. He goes, he goes, and uh, at the end, we realize we just gotta ditch our boards, and he does a pencil dive down, and it breaks right on top of him. And as he's going down, it's broken, and I'm still like 20 yards behind him, so I'm just standing there, and I start going towards the whitewash because hopefully it'll like lessen. And it was like thunder. Like I've never heard a wave so loud in my entire life where it just got louder and louder the closer it got to us. And I eventually, I dove straight in. I was, pad I was swimming hard. I felt good about it. I was about to make it through. I opened my eyes and I just, I see myself getting pulled right back over the falls. So I uh, eventually, I was just getting tumbled around. I didn't know which way was up. And I got saved by the reef, surprisingly. 
because it was about like 10 to 12 feet down and my feet touched the reef and I was able to use whatever I had left to push myself back up to the top. And uh, if it, honestly, if it wasn't for that reef, I really don't know where I was because I was out of breath and I had no which way to go up. And so I got up, I just, I just thanked the Lord that he gave me that reef to save myself. And I thought that was the last time I felt like I was probably going to be close to uh, not making it on that trip, but it was not. In that trip, we had plenty of experiences that I will never forget. And uh, I just want to thank you all for letting me share that story. Happy Sabbath. I know we're kind of running a little bit late, so I don't want to take too much of your time, but it was a really wonderful trip, really, honestly. And everybody that came along with us, like, really did a wonderful job of connecting with the kids and, and the adults over there. Everyone in Fiji is so welcoming and so loving, and it doesn't even, it's so genuine that you meet them day one, and it feels like they've been your friend for a couple years already. You know, they know, like, they're expecting you, but they haven't even met you yet. So it's really awesome, just like, just the people there are amazing. And something I found, like, when we went to that waterfall, we hiked to a waterfall, I believe they put the picture up there. I brought a camera with me so I could take pictures and videos of us jumping in, and I lost it. I lost it under the waterfall. And obviously, anyone who's been to a waterfall knows it's not really easy to swim in a waterfall because you're getting pushed back pretty hard. And the two guides that came with us, one of them's name is Vili. Vili took it upon himself to find my camera. And he, it was, took about like 15 or 20 minutes. And he, we, luckily my dad had some scuba diving goggles and, or just regular snorkeling goggles. And eventually he came up and he was holding my camera. So didn't really talk to him a lot that much on that trip until then, but he didn't really care. It was just something he needed to do to help me, and I appreciated it a lot. And the people there were really awesome.